Hello, everybody. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. Of course, right now I am still up in Connecticut, but nonetheless, we're going to push forward with our reading and our study of the Magdalene Manuscript. This is part 8E. This section is going to be a little bit shorter today than most. As you guys know, I am dividing this book into smaller sections and what they, the writer has this book divided into just so you can take the time to really integrate the teachings. I do apologize if you hear some noises around me. There is some yard work going on outside and I have a cute little dog that you might hear her clicking around um, the dining room as I record this. But anyway, um, if you're new to the channel, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. I would suggest you starting with part one. I will put the playlist called Understanding the Magdalene that has all the parts to the Magdalene manuscript. It also contains all the parts of Megan Watterson's book on Mary Magdalene, which we started, that's what we started with, and also the Sophia Code, which we have just completed. All right, so let's get into the Magdalene Manuscript, Part 8E. This is the alchemy of relationship. Many of us do relationships the way we play poker. We do everything possible to get the upper hand, and if that fails, we bluff. We pretend to hold cards we don't have, we cheat, we lie. And while this is the model for many relationships in our postmodern era, it is not the model for its sacred relationship as described in the manuscript. Let me be very upfront here. Sacred relationship is not for everyone. In fact, I suspect there are far fewer persons capable or even willing to undertake it than there are those who prefer to play emotional card games. This type of relationship demands utmost honesty, both with oneself and with one's partner. Instead of hiding our cards, we lay them out on the table. All our hopes, all our fears, all of our petty and jealous thoughts, all our covenings, all of it to get laid out in the clear light of awareness for who, for our partner to see. And he or she must do the same. It will not work if there are any back doors unlocked with mental escapes in mind. It will not work if both partners are not absolutely impeccably honest with each other. And the reason for this radical type of honesty is that without it, the alchemy of relationship cannot take place. Now, this may be a new term to many, even students of internal alchemy, since the dynamics of intimate relationship are rarely discussed in the four major alchemical streams, Egyptian, Taoism, Yoga Tantra, and Buddhist Tantra. So I think it might be good to define what I mean here and to lay some type of foundation. Like all types of alchemy, this type of work is about changing one form into another. The form in this case is the inner dynamics that have become habitual between two people. And after a while, people tend to get into ruts. The liveliness that existed at the beginning of relationship begins to fade, the honeymoon period. Both people become more or less unconscious. The harsh reality is that it takes continual diligence and effort to keep a relationship conscious and alive. Many relationships drop by the wayside because the partners are either unwilling or unable to make the efforts required to sustain them. Instead of experiencing the newness of each moment within the relationship, a kind of dullness seeps in over time. What used to be exciting is now boring. And worse, a kind of psychological and emotional lethargy sets in and both partners succumb to the dueling effects of unconsciousness. This type of unconsciousness is a death kill to psychological awareness and insight. And although it is rarely mentioned, this type of unconsciousness has a negative effects on one's spiritual life as well. So the form that needs to be changed within a relationship is literally the form of interactions that habitually takes, take place between the two partners. Like all types of alchemy, there must be a container for the reactions to occur. And in this case, it is a container of safety and appreciation that provides the reservoir for transformation. If there is a lack of safety or appreciation, this type of alchemy cannot be undertaken. And if you have decided you wish to try this type of alchemy in your relationship, I suggest you do so as an analysis first. Honestly assess if you feel safety and appreciation in your relationship. If you don't, you will be wasting your time trying to undertake this type of alchemy with your current partner. I suggest you focus your efforts instead on a solitary practice mentioned in the manuscript. If you still want to give it a try, get your partner to talk about these feelings of danger and lack of appreciation that you are feeling. 
only if and when they get resolved should you consider taking taking on this type of alchemy. Absolutely. I've actually really gone into a deep place of healing for myself so that I can be in this type of a relationship because that type of honesty starts with you being really honest with yourself first and really going and doing the shadow work and healing yourself so that you can, you are in a place to put all your cards on the table for your partner or soon to be partner. And then unfortunately your partner, he or she has to do the same thing too. And if they're not willing to do the same thing, then it's not going to work. So he's right here. So now we have two of the three elements needed for alchemy, something to be transformed, the habitual patterns of an interaction and the container, the safety net, if you will, of the relationship itself. A third element is needed. And that is, of course, energy to drive this reaction. There is usually plenty of energy and relationships in the form of neurotic patterns, hopes, fears and desires. We'll get to all of those in a moment. But for now, I want to talk about steel. Our psychological selves are much more like swords made from still alloys. They have been forged in the hot, searing foundation of our childhood and the formative pressures of our early experiences. It is in this early period of life that bonds the elements of our psyches together. And like still, this was done under immense heat and pressure. Some of us were abused by overbearing or downright hostile or even destructive parents. Some of us were left to our own devices without any kind of support or guidance. And every kind of parental child relationship falls between these two polarities. The possibilities of a childhood pressures are virtually endless. And so too are the psychological alloys that result from these types of experiences. There is a lot of talk about the child within in many personal growth groups. And while there is certainly value in making contact with this younger self, it is not always pretty. No, it's not. I've done a lot of work with that myself in trauma therapy. Our cultural myth is that childhood is a time of innocence, a time in which everything is right with the world. For some children, this is true. For many, it is definitely not. For me, it was definitely not. From the outside looking in, my child left probably looked awesome. My wealthy parents, beautiful home, all the toys, vacations, all that kind of stuff. But there was definitely a lot of abuse in that house. And so for sure, you never know what's happening behind closed doors. I remember being a fellow therapist house for a party quite a few months ago. Most of the adults were practicing therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and several clinical social workers. I just plopped myself into a big oversized sofa and sipped my iced tea. I noticed a remarkable event. One of the therapists had brought his son and his son's best friend to the party. It was clear that the two boys were bugs. They were playing some kind of card game and respectfully giving each other a turn. There were no attempts at cheating, and they seemed to be in a bubble of camaraderie. Then the boy's father came into the room and asked both kids if they needed anything. They both looked up with chair faces and smiles. No, they said, in the cutest little boy voices. The father patted his son on the back, and as he walked off, he nonchalantly pat patted his son's friend on the back as well. For a moment, his son looked at the incident in object horror. You could see that he could not believe his eyes. And then as his father turned the corner into the room, his son pulled back and hit his best friend in the face. This was not childhood innocence. This was childhood rage. He was not willing to share the affections from his father, not even with his best friend. This type of jealousy is typical of higher mammals. And we are, for all our self-righteousness, self-congratulatory delusions, still mammals. No matter how high we get spiritually, we will, for as long as we live, share traits with our mammalian brothers and sisters. The inner life of a child is often far different than those around him or her imagine it to be. Surrounded by both dangers and opportunities, the psychological life of a child is directly shaped by how he or she chooses to deal with them. Whether it is something as life-threatening as a deranged parent or a child or seemingly innocuous as to whom to go to the prom with does not in some ways matter. While the impact of fighting for one's life may very well imprint a child's behavior well into adulthood, the little decisions of life, like who to socialize with or not, also have impact. All these major and minor decisions create internal psychological heat pressure. The alloys of one's personality get bonded together or burned away. The sword has been tempered by, by the time we reach adulthood, and the alloy of our personalities have been set. Some of us emerge from this childhood foundry with sharp edges. Other, others of us are blunt. Some of us hold our edges, and some of us can never seem to hold onto anything. 
The thing about still is that it tends to remain in its original form once it's sleep, it leaves the foundry. And one of the few things that could be ever reconfigured the alloy is that the still gets as hot as it did when it was first formed. Exactly. That's why you have to get hot in your shadow work. You have to actually physically get your body hot because that's the only way you can mold things. As my teacher in India says, the way to clean gold is to boil it, bring it to a boiling point so you can wash the impurities off. Heat or tapas, as it's called in Sanskrit, tapas or agni is of the utmost. You're not doing spiritual work if you're not getting hot, whether with your emotions in therapy or on the mat, sweating, preferably both, 100%. In the alchemical work of sacred relationship, we voluntarily put ourselves back into the foundry. Absolutely. The heat that arises between two people when their neuroses rub against each other can get quite intense. If both people can find the courage to be radically honest with themselves and with each other in these sharing, searing moments, the psychological alloys can be altered. A new type of aliveness that enters the relationship fueled by the energy of psychological truth. The thing is, most of us will do almost anything to avoid psychological heat. Absolutely. When we get uncomfortable, many of us get the hell out of Dodge. Now, for some of us, this means literally packing up and getting out of town or at least out of sight. For some of us, it seems that we are psychologically present, but no longer emotionally present. We numb up. We become auto automatons. We move and talk almost like normal, but we have retreated far, far inside. Other of us numb ourselves with alcohol or drugs, and some of us will do it with television. We are humans. We humans are, after all, quite clever and creative. We can find all sorts of ways to avoid facing ourselves. In fact, they are far too numerous for me to list here, but I suspect you get the idea. I guess the real question here is, what do you do when things get psychologically too hot for you to taste? What do you do when you are on the verge of feeling something that you don't want to feel? For those in sacred relationships, such feelings are a call to presence. It is time to be radically honest. And for both partners to express their true feelings, no matter how embarrassing or scary they might be, by speaking their truths to each other and enlivening elements enters the dynamic. Psychological honesty results in psychological insight. And with insight, there is hope for awareness. And with awareness, there can be change. This chapter is hardly a manual for the alchemy of relationship. It's mainly, I think, a warning. Magdalene alluded to this in the manuscript. She calls it obscurations to flight. That sounds wonderfully exotic, doesn't it? Well, it isn't very exotic when the obscuration is clearly in your face. And it isn't very exotic feeling when the foundry of the relationship gets so hot that you feel you are dissolving. Psychologically, that is. It takes courage and fortitude to stay in the foundry when the heat begins to weaken the stability of one's self-perceived image. Few of us care to look foolish, scared, petty, or jealous, and we will often go through elaborate means to hide these feelings from ourselves and others. But in sacred relationship, these things invariably float to the surface like mud that has been stirred up from the bottom of a barrel. The thing is to realize that this does not mean you are doing a sacred relationship wrong. It means you are probably doing it right. I tell my students that all the time. If you're uncomfortable, if you're pissed off, you got to go throw up. You're doing it right. It worked. The alchemy worked. As Magdalene said in the manuscript, the power of the alchemy extrudes or pushes out the dross. This can be fascinating when the dross is being pushed out of your partner, but it's truly horrific when it extrudes. But it's truly horrific when it comes out of you. What makes sacred relationships sacred is that it is truly a holy way of being. The root of the word holy actually means to make whole. So when we do something that creates wholeness, in this case, psychological wholeness, we are engaged in a sacred or holy act. In the crucible of mutual safety, honesty and appreciation, it is possible to forge a new kind of self. This new self is psychologically more honest, more aware, and freer than its counterpart before entering the foundry of relationship. And like the phoenix that rises from its own ashes, this self has wings. It can fly places that could, it could only imagine before. There are mysteries here and treasures that await those who have the courage to enter the depths of themselves and their partners. It is not, as I said, for everyone. You will probably know if you are more, more of a likely candidate because you will feel it in your soul and your heart. If you enter this path, know that there are no ma manuals. There is precious little guidance out there. The path to spirituality has traditionally been one of solitude. Absolutely. And there he's right. The work in yoga, it's just teaching you how to do, how to make yourself uncomfortable. It doesn't tell you what to do once you feel your shadow work come on. You have to do that yourself. And it is a very lonely path for sure.
in which and while times of solitude may be necessary for those in a sacred relationship something has turned they agree to walk the path of the godhead together side by side through both heaven and hell through the brilliant summits where all things are suddenly crystal clear and through the dark valley of psychological death where it is hard to even see one's foot in front of the other and yet through the darkness of not knowing a deep primordial force begins to rise up it requires an unusually type of holy trinity three things for it to do its most holy task mutual safety psychological honesty and appreciation of the beloved have a good journey he does have a note to the reader here which we will read there is an implicate danger in writing about such things as sacred relationship yes for one some people might assume that the writer is an expert on such matters i assure you that i am not and i wish to place into a written record this fact if any teacher tells you they found enlightenment they surely have not for sure have not i have found myself several times running from the heat of the founder of relationship for as i mentioned earlier when the emotional and psychic heat of a sacred relationship gets really hot there's a tendency to feel that oneself is being obliterated of course what is being obliterated or at the very least challenged is our own neuroses not our existence which is what feels what which is what it feels like our neurotic habits are tendencies and they don't give up easily this is also attached to the ego too my experience is that that they often fight to death so to speak rather than fade gracefully into the past but that is just my personal experience and i don't wish to imply that this might be your experience as well the art of sacred relationship i believe is learning how to be in the heat of transformation and not automa automatically run from it i also think that this way of being in a relationship is enough with another is one of the most challenging and rewarding things i've ever asked of myself because this way of relationship is so dynamic and life changing i think the entrance into this path should have a warning sign so here it is warning enter this path with sobriety and abandon know that those who enter the path will never be the same nor will you i was redundant here for those of you who think you are an exception to everyone else all right guys we're going to end it there and next week we'll start on a woman's story in this manuscript thank you so much and i hope that you're having an awesome day i'll talk to you soon bye